Well, happy Easter. Easter. If you're a guest, really glad you're here. My name's Blake. I'm the pastor here and excited that you're here to celebrate Easter. And Easter is a conglomeration of things in American culture, right? We've got pastel colors. See lots of that. We've got fake plastic grass. We've got very large bunnies, lots of sugar, and church attendance. (laughs) I don't always see how it fits together, but because Jesus rose from the dead, a very large bunny has infiltrated your backyard and laid eggs with candy, and you have to go find them now. Happy Easter. Well, that's Easter in American culture, and that's all fun and fine, but Easter really is much more than that. And Easter is really the heart of the Christian faith. And I want us this morning just to look at one verse, probably a familiar passage if you've been in church much, and it's from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, In Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I just want us to think of two basic points this morning from this verse. And one is the need for Easter, and two is the gift of Easter. So first, the need for Easter. And the need for Easter is death. Death brings about the need for Easter. I know you probably didn't want to come here and think all morbidly this morning, but there really is no happy Easter. There really is no good news of Easter if we don't reckon with the necessity of Easter, which is the bad news that causes us to need Easter. And it is the fact that all people die. We try not to think about it, but it's true. The odds are incredible. Ten out of ten will die. You've heard it said, nothing is more certain than taxes and death. Death is the great leveler. Death is the ultimate equalizer. And contrary to popular opinion, it is completely unnatural. Death is not a natural part of life. Oftentimes when folks pass away in in their latter years, whether it's 80s or 90s, people will say, well, what was the cause of death? And oftentimes it's described as, well, it was natural causes. Wrong. Death is fundamentally unnatural. No one dies of natural causes. God created this world originally with no death. Death is always bad. Death is called in the Bible an enemy. It is fundamentally unnatural. In some way, it is is the most unnatural thing in the world. It wasn't supposed to be that way. It is a bad thing. In fact, even Jesus agreed. Jesus, in John chapter 11, one of his friends passed away. And Jesus knows that he's going to go and bring him back to life. And John 11 says that it's the easiest verse to memorize. Jesus wept, shortest verse in the Bible. And then John goes on to describe and said that Jesus was angry within himself. And that's a startling term. Jesus was upset about death, even though he knew that Lazarus would be brought back to life very soon. So the need for Easter is the reality of death. Easter is needed because of the first part of our verse. The wages of sin is death. The reason we die, friends, is because we sin, because we disobey God, because we center our lives around something or someone besides him. That is sin, and the wages of sin is death. Death is God's judgment on sin. Again, God created the world without sin and without death. And there was this garden, and it was an ocean of yeses, but there was one no. And God told our first parents, Adam and Eve, that not to eat from this one tree because it would show that they thought they knew better than God, and they did. And what was the result? You shall surely die. There was no death originally. Death came about because of sin. Adam and Eve thought they knew better, and we followed suit ever since. And so we all die, dust to dust. All die because all sin and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and sin is an honest employer. It will not cheat its employees. So sin results in death. That's why we need Easter. But we also need Easter because of the reality that all will die. All people fear death. Woody Allen famously said, I don't fear death. I'm good. I just don't want to be there when it happens. 
Larry King, very well known, he's in his 80s now, known for talking about how f- dreadfully fearful of death he is. He talks about it regularly and says, everyone fears death. And someone says that they don't fear death, I don't believe them, they're lying. And so he wants, he's putting his stock in freezing his body. And so maybe there'll be a cure later on for whatever it is that ended up taking him so he could be thawed out and have more life. Yet more life, he's just grasping. And so for $130,000, you can get your body injected with some fluid and freeze it and store it in Arizona or New Hampshire. But if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, friends, you should fear death. It's a rightful thing to fear death if you don't know the Lord. Hebrews 9 says, it's appointed for people to die once and after that, judgment. And so I want you to fear that. I want you to hear that. Every day, indeed, every second, every person in this auditorium is marching their way towards their death. We're closer every minute, every second. Every year we pass unawares the anniversary of the day we will die. The Apostle James describes life as a mist. Just think about a water bottle or maybe hairspray. That's your life, James says. It's a mist that appears for just a little while and then vanishes. Friends, this ought to be humbling. And even more than humbling, this ought to be sobering. Regardless of how high we fly, we will all come down. For one day, every one of us will lie flat on our back, stone cold dead. Happy Easter. (laughs) And the thing about it is, that day is going to come so much sooner than we realize. It just does. It's going to come extremely fast. Life is a mist. Here's, Here's a thought experiment for you. Just think. Don't answer, but how many of you know the names of your great-grandparents. Ecclesiastes 111. There is no remembrance of those who came before. And of those who will come after, there will also be no remembrance by those who follow them. So forget knowing the names. Maybe some of you could conjure it up. Yeah, I got it, that name. But think about it. When is the last time you actually thought of your great-grandparents? Just a few generations out of sight out of mind. So we've got to have something on to base our hope. We're going to be forgotten. No legacy. Three generations. We're out of sight, out of mind. What are we hoping? What are we basing our lives on? If you're not a follower of Christ here this morning, what are you living for? What is your hope? What are you basing your hope on? Steve Jobs was also a guy who was pretty vocal about his fear of death. In fact, he tells us that's why the iPhone doesn't have an on or off switch. He doesn't like to think about it. He doesn't like to think about death, so he didn't want his products to have on or off. So if you have an Apple product, you don't turn it off. It either goes to sleep or it goes on standby. But as you probably know, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he was forced to think a little more about death. And he tried to be optimistic. And towards the end of his life, as he was thinking he might get better, he he had a commencement speech at the University of Stanford. And trying to be optimistic about it, he said, death gives a chance for new beginnings for others. But think about that for a moment. If that's all there is, is that really that encouraging? Hey, you're going to die, but don't worry. Someone else is going to get your job and slowly but surely desecrate not only your legacy, but also your product. It's not very encouraging. We need Easter, and we need the hope that Easter provides every one of us because all have sinned against God in word, thought, and deed God's judgment lays upon us because all of sins, we earn death. So we have reason to fear death. We should. The wages of sin is death. That's the need for Easter. Well, what's the gift of Easter? What's the good news? What's happy about Easter? It's the second part of our verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The need for Easter is that because of our sin, we will die. But the gift of Easter is that those who trust in Christ will be raised from the dead, will be given eternal life. Have you ever wondered what Christianity is for? Like big picture. What is Christianity for? What is the ultimate aim? What is the purpose of the Christian faith? Let's think for a minute about other religions. What are they there for? Well, Islam, the end goal, the aim is that you'd be one of those few righteous enough to enter paradise and have your way with 72 black-eyed virgins. Clearly a man-made 
faith, is it not? That's the goal, though. The goal of Mormonism is that you could be really, really good and be among that few that would be holy enough to one day own your own planet and be a god, lowercase g. That's the end goal of Mormonism. The end goal of Buddhism is a, is a solid reincarnation. Hindus, very similar. If you collect enough good karma, you might have a suitable reincarnation. That's the end goal. The end goal of Jehovah's Witness is that you would be, again, very holy to make that cut. You know, there's only room for 144,000 in their heaven. So the goal is to make that cut by your deeds and then be there. There's some false versions of Christianity that say the goal of Christianity is that you'd be happy, wealthy, and healthy. That's not what the Bible teaches. But what about biblically? What is the end goal? What is this for? I think one of the main ways is the overcoming of death. John 3.16 is popular for a reason. God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not die, should not perish, but have eternal life. The end goal is that we won't perish, but we will be with Christ. Because of his resurrection, we will be with him forever. So the wages of sin, what we earn is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that it's a gift. It is a gift. There are a lot of people, even within the church, that don't understand the gift that God has given in the gospel. And they basically live ex Sound guy only gets credit when things go bad. <laughs> there we go. So it's a gift. Is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sadly, many people actually reject something that's not Christianity, but they think it is because they don't understand that it's a gift. So what they end up doing is rejecting moralism. They reject not the gospel. They reject a distorted version of moralism. Listen, friends, this is really important, especially if you haven't been in church in a while. Christianity and its message is not be good. It is not be better. The message of Christianity is that no one is good. That we can't be better. I love the way one pastor puts it. Tim Keller says, and this is really important, this is the difference between the Christian religion and every other religion. He says that the every other religion is based on this operating principle of I do my part, I perform, I work, therefore God accepts me and God loves me. So you do your part, you clean up your act, you be good, therefore God will accept you. That is not what the Bible teaches. Every other religion teaches that, everyone. The operating principle of what Scripture teaches, of the gospel, is the very opposite, that through faith we trust in Christ and are loved by God and accepted by God. Therefore, we go about trying to better our lives and to be more like Jesus. That order is extremely important. It is a gift. It's not something you earn. Eternal life is something you receive through faith in Jesus Christ. It, we are saved by grace, not by works. So eternal life is the gift of God through Jesus. Gifts are to be received. And so maybe that's you this morning. How do you receive this gift? How do you receive the gift of eternal life? It's simple. You trust in Christ. You come to the end of yourself and you turn to the Lord. You turn from your sin and you turn to Jesus and you receive him as Lord and Savior. Turn from your self-focused life and turn to Christ who died for your sins. The gift of Easter really is about the Lord meeting our fundamental need. I love the way D.A. Carson puts it. He says, if God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and he sent us a savior. The gift of Easter is about the Lord graciously meeting our greatest need. And notice that the verse says, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those little three little words are really important. In Christ Jesus. Jesus. Eternal life is only found in Christ Jesus. Christianity is an exclusive religion. 
It says the only way to be saved is through Christ. It says the only way to the Father is through Jesus. And that is really offensive in our culture, is it not? But it shouldn't be for a few reasons. Number one, it shouldn't be because really every religion is exclusivist. Every one of them, Islam, Buddhism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of them are exclusive. And you say, well, that's exactly right. That's why I'm not a religious person. But let me submit that your view as well is actually arrogant and exclusive. Give me a minute. It's the view that says, well, they're all the same. All religions are the same. They all end up at the same place. We're all on different sides of the mountain, but they all get there. Let's call that the Oprah view. There's a movie with a really crazy character, and he has a car wreck, and he's so jolted by the car wreck that he thinks he's on fire, and so he jumps out of the car, and he's running around, and he's praying, and he wants to hedge his bets, and so he prays to Jesus, save me, to the Jewish God, help me, to Allah, save me, to Tom Cruise, use your witchcraft on me to get the fire off, (laughs) help me, Oprah Winfrey. (laughs) Well, here's what Oprah the Divine says. She says, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there's only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to God. And let me submit that even though that's the air we breathe, that is actually extremely arrogant to say. I mean, how does she know? What holy book is that written in? Because the the fact of the matter is the world's religions actually contradict one another in major ways. And so who is she to say, actually, there's no difference? I mean, I can imagine, that kind of works here in the West, but I can imagine going over to the East somewhere, going over and saying, you know what, Palestinian Muslim, you know what, Israeli Jew, I know that you're literally losing family and friends over this. I know that you can literally swim in the blood that has been spilled because the differences between your religion, but I'm Oprah, and there's really no difference after all, don't fret. That is extremely arrogant to say that. That is a uniquely Western Enlightenment view that most of the world doesn't hold to and never has. So they're not all the same. Let's just look at one element here. The world's religion's difference takes on Jesus. Buddhism says he was just an enlightened man like Buddha. Hindus say he was an an incarnation of God like Krishna. Islam says he was a mere man and a prophet but inferior to Muhammad. Jehovah's Witnesses say that he was merely the archangel, Michael, the created being that became a man. Mormons teach that Jesus was only a man who became one of many gods, that he was a polygamist and the half-brother of Lucifer. New Age guru Deepak Chopra says Jesus is merely a state of consciousness that we can all aspire to. Scientology says he was an implant forced on Thetan a million years ago. And Christians believe that he is God incarnate who came to redeem sinners through his death, resurrection, and ascension. But yeah, you know what? They're all the same. They're basically saying the same thing. No, that is an arrogant view. There's often this illustration of an elephant used to talk about religions and and their grasp of truth. And missionary from uh, Britain who went to India, Leslie Newbigin, shows that it really doesn't work. The illustration is that there's this elephant and all the world's religions are approaching, they're all blind, and they're approaching the elephant from different perspectives. And so the Buddhist comes and grabs the tail and says, yeah, it's like a snake. Um, this, is, this animal is like a snake. And then you got the Christian over at the, at the, t- the, the ears and, say, well, it's floppy. It's kind of like a leaf or, or a piece of paper. And then you've got the Muslim at the tree and say, no, no, y'all are all wrong. It's, it's more like a, a tree trunk. And, and what's true for each is true. They're not wrong. And so that's the way it is with all religions. They're all really trying to describe the same thing. There really is no comprehensive view of truth. We're all just grasping like blind people on an elephant. But what's the problem with that illustration? It's claiming that there is no comprehensive view of truth, yet it's told from the perspective of a comprehensive view of truth. It's told from a God's eye perspective by someone who's not blind. All the religions are blind. I'm not. I'm just watching the poor blind people trying to describe reality. That's actually extremely arrogant. The Oprah view is very arrogant, but it's also exclusive to other views. They say, you're arrogant if you don't agree with me that all other views are the same and none are to be excluded. You see, it's exclusive of exclusive views. And it just doesn't work. It's a view that says there is no truth. There is no absolute truth. There is no capital T truth. But what that's doing is like taking a saw, climbing up a tree, scooting out on a limb, and taking the saw and just sawing it off. 
Because to say that there is no absolute truth is a declaration of absolute truth, is it not? There is no comprehensive view of truth, no absolute truth. Well, is that a true statement? Yeah. Is it an absolutely true statement? Yeah. Here's your saw. It won't work. It won't work. All viewpoints at the end of the day are exclusive. Second reason it won't work is we're not saying, I mean, they shouldn't be too offended by the fact that Christianity is exclusive. We're not saying that we're better than anybody. Often the charge is, well, you Christians are so exclusive. You think you're better than every other religion. And that's just not the case. We're not saying we're better. In fact, Christians are the ones who are saying we know that we're not better. We know that we need help which is why we have turned to Christ. We know that we are fallen and sinful people, so we turn to Christ as the Savior and the one who will forgive us our sins. We know that we're actually worse than most, so we actually, Christianity is a voice of humility in an age of arrogance. So we're not saying we're better. And the third, we're not saying that Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus says Jesus is the only way to God. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so you can't really get mad at followers of Jesus for following Jesus. He's the one who said it. And he is the unique one who offers salvation. Jesus alone is God made flesh who lived a perfect life. The life we should have lived. So yes, eternal life is found only in Christ. But notice it says, in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word Lord is important as well. It has implications for how we live, right? Because lords have authority. Lords have authority. That's why sometimes the Bible calls Christians slaves of Jesus Christ. So after we trust in him, we have to live for him. As we sing, we owe him all. And the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life. And I think most of the time when we hear that, we think of length of life, right? Life that never ends, and that's true. But it has more than that. The word actually could be translated the life of the age to come. It's about quantity and quality. It's about a certain quality of life that we have now. That's why Jesus says in John 10, 10, I came to give them life and life abundantly. So there's just something about the life lived for Jesus that is the life worth living. And so eternal life has implications for now, but clearly it does also have implications for all of eternity. Life that never ends. Resurrection life. For the believer, death doesn't have the last word. Though we die, we will be raised from the dead. George Herbert said, death for us used to be an executioner. The resurrection means he's now just a gardener. And we'll be raised from the dead because Jesus was raised from the dead. The resurrection is the heart of the Christian faith. Again, Christianity is uniquely grounded on a historical event. History matters. And we have an abundance of evidence for the history, the historicity of the resurrection. Just think about the church. There's really no other way to explain the church. The church has outlasted empires. It spread to every language and culture of the planet. How? Why? Why have innumerable believers died for their faith? How? Why? What explains the turnabout in the disciples? We've been studying the letter of 1 Peter, and Peter's a great case study because think of Peter. Peter goes from being a waffling coward, so much so that this teenage girl comes up and asks him if he follows the Lord, and he denies his Lord. And he does it two other times. But that coward turned into one who would boldly and fearlessly proclaim the name of the Lord until the day that he was die. He died. He was crucified upside down for his faith. What explains the, the transition in Peter? The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It vindicated his claims. It led to the birth of the most powerful movement the world has ever known, the church of Jesus Christ. Though many have sought to deny the resurrection, some say he really didn't die. Jesus really didn't die. It looked like he died and he went on, but this just doesn't fit first century historical context. If there's anything that Romans knew how to do, it was to kill people. They were professional executioners. They did crucifixion after crucifixion. It was a fun, they had it down to a T. Sometimes they would do as many as 6,000 crucifixions a day. And so to say that he didn't die is just not 
not accurate historically. Some say that the disciples stole his body and hid it somewhere, and they made, they made the whole thing up. It was all a big hoax. But again, this doesn't work for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a whole lot of counterproductive material in the Gospels if it was man-made. There's a lot of things that, you, that are, we find in the Gospels that honestly wouldn't help their cause if it was a man-made thing. Again, just think of Peter. The fool had his foot in his mouth most of the time. He ended up being one of the key leaders of the church. You don't want to paint him in that kind of portrait unless it's historical. And it is historical. And when it comes to the resurrection, there were actually all four Gospels say that it was women that were the first witnesses to the empty tomb and came back and reported. And we read that and no big deal. But in first century culture, that would have been scandalous. Because in first century Roman culture and Jewish culture, the testimony of women was not counted. You couldn't testify in court if you were a woman in the first century. Because your witness wasn't considered trustworthy. And so if you're making this thing up, you're not going to put women as your key witnesses. You're going to have your top men. But they didn't care about making it look good. They cared about what happened historically. So women were the key witnesses. But also, the New Testament mentions many times the idea of eyewitnesses. There were many eyewitnesses. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, probably the greatest chapter on resurrection in the New Testament, it says that the risen Christ came and he appeared to his disciples and then 500 eyewitnesses, many of whom are still alive. Implication? Go ask them. You couldn't say that if it wasn't the case. You'd be busted. So there were many eyewitnesses that would be able to attest to the risen Christ. And then the third reason is that why would they make something up and then die for it? Most of the disciples died for their faith. It's one thing to die for something that, you, that was a mistake, but you didn't know it. But this view says the disciples stole the body, made the whole thing up, and then were willing to die for their faith. No way. Rapper, Christian rapper Shylin, he says it better than I can, and he makes it rhyme. So let me read some lyrics from his song, Jesus is Alive. Throughout history, there's been mad religious leaders, prophets, preachers, scholars, teachers. But when it came to the grave, no one could climb out. That's where Jesus stands alone, like taking a time out. And don't be misled. I've got a level head. No resurrection. Christianity would have never spread. The disciples weren't stupid guys who would ruin their lives and then choose to die for what they knew was a lie. That would be beyond ridiculous. Now the issue is the risen Christ seen by 500 eyewitnesses. Imagine 500 people in a court of law, each of them taking the stand, reporting what they saw. If their stories lined up and made sense, the evidence would have to leave you convinced Jesus is alive. The body was never found. He was raised from the dead. Resurrection, Easter, hope. This is the basis of our hope. The physical resurrection of Jesus is the basis of our hope. And the biblical vision of the future is not immaterial. It's not of chubby angels and clouds and harpy things. No, the vision of the future in the Bible is physical. And we're going to do a lot more than sing. I love to sing, but we're going to not, it's not going to be an eternal choir practice in heaven. We tend to think that, right? And we sing it with amazing grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. There'll be singing, but all of life will be undiluted worship. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we will be raised. And indeed, the world will be raised, Romans 8 tells us. Physical bodies on a physical earth. And that's why the Bible refers to death as sleep. Because when we die, if we die before the Lord returns, our body and our souls are torn asunder in a way they were never meant to. But as the Lord returns and resurrects this world and resurrects our body, he will unite our body and our soul. And we will live physically with the Lord forever and ever on a new heavens and new earth. New bodies on a new world wearing Easter attire. <laughs> and it will be glorious to have no aches and no pains, no back pain, no flu, no sickness. That's going to be awesome. That's no small thing. But that's not the ultimate hope of resurrection. The ultimate hope is being with him. Maybe some of you know Johnny Erickson Tata. She was, she's an author and she's now uh, getting, getting up there in age. But when she was 17, she had a diving accident and made her a quadriplegic. It hasn't used her legs in over 50 years. 
And one time someone asked her, Johnny, what is it you're going to do first when you get those resurrected legs? Probably thinking, what would she do? You know, do jumping jacks, skip, run, dance. She wasn't a Baptist. She said, I'm going to fall on my glorified knees and praise the Lord for saving my soul. Easter, resurrection, the overcoming of death. And so, brothers and sisters, we don't need to fear death if you're in Christ. For us, death is not a period, it's a comma. And I love the way the Apostle Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks trash to death. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We can talk trash to death. That reminds me of one of the, one of the top five greatest movies ever produced, Rocky III. <laughs> you remember that scene? I know you remember it. Rocky Balboa, Clubber Lane, and he, he begins to take an edge, and he just starts talking trash. He's taking hits. You ain't so bad. You ain't so bad. That's what it makes me think of death. You ain't got nothing. Because you ain't got nothing on my king. You have no sting. You have no victory. You're not a comma. You're just a period. So because of Easter, because Jesus has defeated the grave, we will defeat the grave. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we're freed from death. And brothers and sisters, we should be freed from the fear of death. I love the way the author of Hebrews puts it in chapter two. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that, here's the purpose of the incarnation, by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He defeats the one who holds the power of death through his own death, and he frees us. And if we're freed from the power of death, brothers and sisters, what should we fear? As a pastor, I get to be a part of a lot of funerals, and they all stink. But there is one funeral that I'm looking forward to, and you're going to join me if you're in Christ. All the saints will gather together and we'll be at a funeral and it'll be the last funeral. We won't be there to mourn. We'll be there to celebrate because we're going to join hands and sing songs about the death of death itself. For those who've trusted in Jesus, the one who destroyed death by death, we will attend the funeral of death. Death is still an enemy, but it is defeated. The death sentence on the last enemy has been issued. The death sentence on death has been set in stone because the stone was rolled away. Its days are numbered. Jesus said again in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked. And I would just repeat his question. Do you believe this?